Okay, time for another NZ Aviation podcast. Now with our new Patreon page, Martin, that's uh, patreon.com forward slash NZ Aviation podcast. Already we have one Patreon for that. And we've got four Patreons now for Bring Our Birds Home. So, hey, not not so bad. And we're aiming Mm -hmm. to do this uh, podcast on a weekly basis. Um, Sometimes there might be a little glitch in that because, like I say, we've got busy lives and we've got to find time between two time zones to do this. But anyway, Martin, we're still in the uh, grips of COVID-19, depending on who you um, believe. There might be some sort of resurgence going on. Very interesting to see, and you sent me this link, that there are now, um, well, reports, I guess those reports are accurate, that uh, scientists, I think I think you said th- it was in Spain, have discovered in a water sample from early in 2019, um, uh, COVID-19 virus what fragments or evidence of the virus being in that water which means it's been around about a year longer than anyone thought wow no one saw that coming yeah that's that's um quite quite interesting information and it kind of ties in with what the swedish health minister has been saying for a while he's saying by the time we recognized that it was a pandemic it was probably too late simply but you know looking at the curves of the way or the way it or how quickly it propagated and all that type of thing Yes, and that seems to be tying into what some people have been saying for a while, that it's, it was around for a lot longer than we thought. Yes, so Spain has discovered it in a water sample from a wastewater treatment plant, um, yeah, March. Now, that's got to be checked and, and rechecked and checked again, but it is quite, quite. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important information, and, and, and we'll see what comes of that. Yeah, because that, that now brings into question where it came from, what the timeline was, how long it took for it to be a noticeable, well, pandemic, epidemic, pandemic, uh, and, uh, you know, the Chinese, the, the timeline for the Chinese getting onto it. Um, what we thought before, um, I read that headline and that story, I thought, changes everything potentially. Yes, it does. And it'll hopefully, well, well potentially, it'll, it will change um, responses to things like this in the future. And maybe people will be um, considering just, ongoing background checks of stuff like that because how many mild um viral strains have passed through us without really knowing without really knowing about it well there must have been a situation here where there was not enough uh, uh cases that were obvious to any health system or uh, um or at any scale um uh, for quite a long time and it must have just been that people got this thing and thought it was the flu maybe or a bad cold yeah. never really um, got tested in, in the way that we test now. And you can see how that could go under the radar for quite some time um, until, mm. what, you get some sort of critical mass of spread. And that's maybe what happened in, in the Chinese situation, given the density of the population and et cetera, et cetera. But you still wonder where it came from. It's, it's well, did it, it come it, from that it, it wet might... market? The timing seems to suggest that maybe it didn't. I don't know. <clears throat> It might still have come from the same place, but um, yeah, exactly as you say, you know, that's the whole, how do you say, that's the, um, how epidemics work. At, soon, at, at some point, there's a critical mass and it just, just you know, rolls off down the hill, getting, picking up speed as it goes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly um, going to give people a, a lot to think about. And now, obviously, they're going to go back with that data and they're going to see how many people are dying in various countries of yeah flu, um, pneumonia, all these types of things. Because that's what the Russians were saying. The Russians, the, 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 the Russians said they, they had a spike in pneumonia cases in, in November, December, which ah. before they really were thinking about COVID. And, of course, it is apparently relatively easy to misdiagnose COVID as, as well, it, 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 it's like a type of pneumonia. Wow. Never gets boring. Mm. Couldn't write the script if you tried. There you go. No. Um, on my screen here, you'll see the beautiful Vickers VC-10. That's going to be um, our aircraft, uh, well, of the day, of the week. We're going to talk about that later on in the program. But I, but just a comment I would make about that aircraft. Now, I've always been in love with the shape of that aircraft right from when I was a boy. It first flew in the air I was born, coming up nearly 60 years now. I think this is almost the perfect aircraft. Okay, it might not have been that fuel efficient compared to the competition, but that was for certain reasons. It's uh, operating um, requirements, et cetera, by uh, BOAC and the empire and all that. But the thing gave great service, 
passengers loved it. It was the quietest cabin. It was almost the fastest wing. It could land uh, on relatively short runways. Hot and high was what it was designed for. It had auto land, so you could get into, uh, I see, Cat 3C category yeah. approaches, 75 metres visibility. Pea soup, they were operating this thing. Um, and, of course, great service to the RAF uh, in its later days. The VC-10, both the standard and super series. I, I've seen two VC-10s, both RAF. One came to Wellington, XV-109, I think was the registration. I never forget that, coming around the corner and seeing this VC-10 there. And I had a good look at one at the Avalon Air Show uh, near Melbourne uh, back in about 2000. They had one of the tankers there as well. But just a beautiful aircraft. So we'll talk about that um, a bit later on in the program. I'm sure you share those sentiments. Oh yeah, just a fantastic airplane. There's a there's a few videos on YouTube of of um, you know them going into Kampala and places like this. And I was absolutely gutted as a kid when my father wanted to go. Uh, he wanted a trip to Europe, and um, East African Airlines were offering um, via Malawi. They were offering flights to Europe in a VC10. And one of the reasons he wanted to do it is he wanted to get one of the last. He realized it was going to be one of the last, it was the last airline operating the VC-10 commercially, I think, at that time. Yeah. And he had originally flown out to South Africa in the late 60s in a VC-10, and he wanted to get one more flight in because he said it had been such such a fantastic experience. But Everything, we ended up not going for a variety of reasons, which is pretty sad. Everything about the look of that aircraft is incredible. The tail beautifully sort of crafted uh, fusion of engineering and art. Those engine nacelles that held the Rolls-Royce Conways, they look amazing, especially with the BOAC, you know, Goldie um, typeface uh, uh, logo branding on them. And uh, the, gosh, they, it's serious, um, serious wing too, eh? Big flaps, big flaps. Yes. You could fly yes. real slow. And and, yeah, and, and, and apparently it was quite a jump for pilots who had um, – They'd, they'd gone up through the British Airways system or the BOEC system to fly VC-10s. And then when they got rid of the VC-10s, they had to transfer to Boeing aircraft. And apparently they found it quite difficult because, as they say, the VC-10 was very, very easy to fly. Yeah. I met a VC-10 pilot at a um, little lake in um, Lakeland, Florida, as it um, happened. And this was uh, had a seaplane base in this little lake, and we went around to film these guys. And one of the guys who was there with his wife on holiday but visiting the base was an ex-East um, uh, African Airlines VC-10 pilot, a British guy. And he would have yeah. been in his late 70s then. But the thing about that was he flew um, – now, what, um, what, what country was East African based in? Was it Kenya or Nairobi, one of the two? Well, it was a, it was a, it, I don't know, oh, I don't know where the main base was, but it was a collection of like six East African countries. Right. Who but anyway, he flew one of the national yeah. teams out from um, from Africa to the New Zealand Commonwealth Games in Christchurch in 1974. And he says he remembers flying the VC-10 into Christchurch and being there for the Games. And, he, and he, uh, he said it was just an amazing, beautiful aircraft to fly. He went on after that, if I remember rightly, flying with Cathay Pacific on 707s, and he ended his career on Tri-Stars, if, if I remember rightly. But he was very fond of that. So, And they used to fly to New Zealand. BOAC used to fly VC-10s to New Zealand and to, uh, I don't think Fenua Pai, probably not capable of, of ha but definitely into uh, Auckland Airport in the, in the late 60s. So there are pictures around. We might even dig one out for this cast of VC-10s uh, at Auckland. So we'll talk about that uh, aircraft uh, a bit later on. Um, and before we get into the big news, and it mostly is around Australia at the moment with Qantas and uh, Virgin Australia more specifically, but what's this going on with the... Um, with the foreign um, intelligence people in Australia raiding Labor Party, New South Wales Labor Party MPs' offices, um, looking for what? Some sort of collusion with China? What's what's going on? This, this story gets more and more. I mean, only a few weeks ago, China was sort of threatening the tourism industry of Australia and holding things up at the um, Bali and other things up at, at ports. Um, and now this has happened. Um, this must be big news, is it? It is pretty big news, and um, it coincides with some newspaper reports coming that came out yesterday and today that <clears throat> a lot of um, senior MPs official, officials are quite worried also with Premier, the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, is, um, that he signed that Chinese rail and road sort of trade pact hmm. with China without really um, consulting with the federal government. And... Um, 
interestingly about the guy they just arrested, no one's really saying that they don't think it's true. Not even his, not even his colleagues are saying they don't. Shaquille Musselman is his name. He's yeah, from Lebanon. Yeah. Yes, and he's been quite um, quite vocal in his support of China, and um, any anything the federal government's done to sort of try and check the rise of China within Australia, he's been very vocal against that. So yeah, that is um, yeah certainly a, a, a development. Um, <laughs> I think his home and his office were raided pretty well simultaneously, and it's and it's, it's I think uh, the leader of the Labour Party in New South Wales has said. She's absolutely shocked. The, the reason why it interests me, I mean, obviously, uh, as a story in its own right, it's interesting, but um, you're seeing this disconnect also in America between local officials like mayors of cities, even governors, and the federal system, where they're actually mm. almost breaking away and doing their own thing, like they were mm. an autonomous country within a country. And uh, I wonder if we're just seeing a pattern emerge here, and that may be, again, because um, we've talked about it, uh, again, a strategy paying off for China where they've identified individuals uh, in lower ranks um, who uh, can be very strategic and, and crucial in, like, signing off the Belt and Roads thing, you know, um, separate of, uh, well, permission or consultation with the federal government, as it happened what, in, in Victoria, in Australia. Mm -hmm. This disconnect between officials um, at lower government levels uh, and the um, the top level of government. Well, I guess that's I guess that's the benefit for outside influence in the federal system. You can you can divide, can't you, and and target certain areas. I mean, this guy's made no secret of the fact he's a huge fan of China. He thinks it's a great country, and he thinks they've done great things. Daniel Andrews also seems to be quite um quite taken with China. And you've got other things that have happened in Australia as well. For example, the port of Darwin was sold to a Chinese company, more or less. Well, they, I think they got like a 99-year lease wow. on the whole thing. And you just think, yeah, that's... And, and again, there was very little consultation with the federal government. By the time it, it had happened, it was all pretty much too late. Um, at the time, the federal government probably also wasn't particularly anti-China because, you know, it's all very well to complain about selling stuff to China. But if you are completely reliant upon China buying all your stuff, you're probably going to let them buy a few things. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> we'll get onto the plane stuff in just a moment, but you, again, you look in the States with the occupation of um, uh, of Seattle, the central area of Seattle. I mean, normally in any other time, most of the citizens would be vocally saying, get them out, clear it up. It's, it, it, it's a dog's breakfast. But you've got the mayor and local officials almost tacitly supporting what what almost looks like an insurrection. So unless they do something, the federal government can't act because the state yes, and, and and local politicians will will go where they perceive the votes to be, rightly or wrongly. And they obviously think there's more there's more um, benefit in supporting that type of thing than there is in kowtowing to the federal government. And I mean, isn't that the whole point of the federal system? I mean, I'm a bit of a fan of the federal system. So. Well, and the reason, I'm, the reason I'm linking it to that situation in Australia with the, in looking for evidence of Chinese, um, you know, you wonder who, who is persuading these local officials um, to behave in this way and for what reason, who knows? But anyway, it's interesting. And I guess um, we'll hear if they find anything, uncover anything that this, uh, this, guy, this guy's been doing. So um, I'm sure uh, they'll pick something up. <laughs> They'll dig something up. And I see also, surprisingly, the ABC. Oh, I've got something ringing in here. The ABC's laying off, what, about 250 people or something? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder who they will be um, and what areas of the operation they'll be in. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's quite a big It's quite a big deal. Of course, it, it pales in significance with the 6,000 people Qantas is threatening to get rid of. Yeah, let's get on to that. Absolutely. Um, that's a lot of people. And um, I watched uh, Alan Joyce's announcement. He sounded very sort of grave, as you would expect. He's interesting, someone like him delivering bad news with a sort of, <laughs> sort of voice and Irish sort of style he has. I mean, it's... it's yeah. But anyway, uh, there he was and uh, looking very grim. And it um, seems like quite a few management positions are, are going to go there, but 6,000. Wow. And then there's a whole bunch more that stay for uh, up to 2022, sort of furloughed or something like that uh, in anticipation of them picking things up again. But 
uh, you know, that's a that's a lot of people to let go. Uh, big it contraction. Is. That is a that, exactly that is a huge contraction. But you know, um, people are saying a lot of people are saying it. This is going to be the opportunity to clear out vast layers of middle management that that have been. You know, it's it's. This, this is a great excuse to go and actually check what you really need and, and, and to do it with very little. No one's going to no one's going to argue with you You say, it's, well, we, we got to do it. Otherwise, we won't survive. Bang. Uh, I know a few companies, big companies, which are doing very similar things right now. One thing that always uh, gets me is that because um, companies do this sort of purge about every 10, 20 years, they do a big purge up against the wall. But it always seems to be that that management layer seems to find its way back in and sort of calcify with too many people until the next big purge. <laughs> yes. And, and, and part of that is um, people are, people's remuneration is often based upon how many people they're in charge of. So while it's all very good to, oh, you know, we, we, we need to tighten our belts and everything. So they'll cut their costs and, 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 and the, the managers who cut the costs will look good. Pretty soon they're going to be wanting hiring to hire people again because you get more, you get paid more money if you're in charge of 50 people as opposed to 15. Right. So it's, it's, it's all a game, isn't it? Well, he says that um, uh, Project Sunrise in the, in the announcement he made is still on, on the cards, but it's delayed. Um, mm. So... Uh, I guess Airbus can still look ahead to some orders there. Well, they'll be flying the 900 or the 1,000 if they do that. I, f I forget. I think they're getting long-range 1,000s. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that's still going. And um, and he thought it would be, I think, 2022, they're expecting anywhere between 70 and 80% of their normal operation to be back by mm. then. Um, but I wonder about that because here in New Zealand, um, you've probably heard that, there have been some pretty, um, yeah, there's been some inept handling of uh, quarantining um, arriving, uh, well, citizens uh, and residents uh, from overseas recently. You know, it's kind of a Mickey Mouse show. Left hand doesn't yeah. know what the right hand's doing. And that's uh, caused a problem for the government. Uh, according to the latest TVNZ Colmar Brunton poll, they've lost 13 points. Though 63%... Um, uh, rating in the polls is, is probably a bit stratospheric. You're not going to stay there for long. But 13, dropped 13 in the last week and a half, two weeks because of that. So you can see how sensitive people are to that. But what it tells you is that it could be a hell of a long time before any sort of international travel gets back to any sort of normality. Well, Unless we say, sod it in the end, we, th we're over this thing. We don't care if people get it anymore. Screw it. We've got to live, let it in, and we'll deal with it. I think there's a few things there. Um, a, people will say, stuff this. We, 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 we want to go places. And um, they'll have to come up with a plan to keep the people happy. Otherwise, governments will get increasingly unpopular. Secondly, with a proper um, sort of um, management and measurement scheme, there's no reason why you couldn't um, keep a very good eye on, on how things are developing and, and manage the travel process. Um, talking about inept handling, they've had exactly the same thing, particularly in Victoria. It turns out most of the cases that have spread back to the community have been from the security guards who have been managed, who have been guarding the hotels where the people have been quarantined. So they got it. Um, and, and only now, only right now is, is Victoria, they've, they've asked for legal advice from the federal government as to whether or not they can force people in quarantine to be tested. Because at the moment they can't, and a lot of people are not letting themselves be tested. There have been a few refusals here too, um, people yeah. refusing to be tested. Um, though, you know, I guess the public has a right to be concerned because <clears throat> the handling has been inept. And, uh, I mean, I'm no expert in pandemics, but uh, even I could have figured out that probably you don't let anyone go until they've been tested. It's just and, kind of weird. And I mean, they will... Got asked. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anything well, about this but hmm. well it well it turns out nobody else did either how come right. how <laughs> yeah, can how it. can health officials who um can lock down because it's them who give the advice uh, an economy not only of this country but australia and all the other countries um on advice that is so credible but when it comes to the actual um you know the, where the rubber hits the road and the procedural stuff that um 
contains this and, and manages it, uh, they completely epically fail. Now, well, who would believe yeah. what they had to say in the first place? What do they know? It might even just be opinion, actually, in the end. Well, this is, I, I work, generally work on large projects, and the amount of large projects I've been involved in where the, the solution being put forward and the solution which is ordered is absolutely compelling, and then you find out three months after it's installed and meant to go live that it's actually none of it works, like really none of it works. Wow. And you just think, well, yeah, it's all opinion. Yeah. And, and, and the actual rubber hit, hits the road bit, which is really, really hard. And if you spend three years building up a large project and, and, and getting everything lined up to build it, if you haven't spent three years working out how you're going to use it, you've just wasted your time. Wow. You know, it's, it's all about implementation and implementation. I mean, you've got to give the guys a break. It's, this came along very suddenly and they chucked a whole lot of things in really quickly. And you have to accept as a project manager, if you're reacting like that, most of it's not going to work. Bits of it will work. But, uh, bits of all of it will work, but none of all of it, not all of it will work either. You know what I mean? Yeah, but what, what, what don't people understand about you can't go out of the room until you're tested? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, that, 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 am I missing that, something? That slipped through the cracks, Paul. Uh, it's obvious. Uh, and not only now. me, but everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Um, I know. How that, does that, that happen? That truly bizarre. If you want to enter the country, you have to be tested. Bang. That's it. And that's and and they should have brought that in immediately. The mo before they even had quarantine. Well, they no, they've they've, quarantine. they've never had enough tests. They've never admitted that. That's always been the problem. It that's, might be also that the tests aren't one hundred percent reliable as well. Well, that's also the case. Yes, that is definitely the case. And no, they probably never had enough tests. No. Yeah. But they're not going to say that because that's a, that's a public confidence issue. Yeah. But look what happens. Um, now they have to look like a, a, a pack of rank amateurs at it. You know, that's not a good look and it's cost the government. They'll be concerned. 13 points, if you believe that poll. Yes. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, an election in two and a half, three months. Yes, that is an that that is a that is an issue, and um, I, I bet they wish they'd done it differently. But um, I think you hit the nail on the head. The, the, the tests have always been the issue. There's not that there, there, there haven't been enough tests. Anyway, if it was up to me, I know it's controversial. I just open the floodgates, protect the old people, and take it as it comes. Yeah, yeah. Like Sweden, and I think that's yeah. Honestly, honestly, I think that's what's going to happen. I, th I think people are going to get cleverer about the whole testing regime. Testing is going to become a, a, a common occurrence and they're going to manage it rather than eradicate it because I don't think they are going to be able to eradicate it. As, as this just shows, it starts popping up all over the place again. And that will keep on going to the point where, I mean, no one's going to go back into, unless there's people falling over in the street, no one's going back to those other levels. I just can't see it. Anyway, no. now, yeah. um, this got me by surprise. Bain Capital has been the winning bid, offer, whatever you want to call it, um, for Virgin Australia. Um, yeah. Cyrus or Cirrus, you know, they, they pulled out. or we, we thought they were playing negotiating games earlier in the week when we were talking because it kind of looked like they were ready to revisit, you know, come back with a better offer or, or let the thing look like they're prepared to walk away um, but then get back to the table, you know, when it was necessary. But Bain Capital's come in and, and they've been announced the winner. I don't know if you could say winner. It sounds like a bit of a basket case situation, but Bain, yeah. I look at, look at Bain Capital and their history is of pulling businesses to pieces and putting them back together again or just selling off the pieces. So um, I can't see Virgin Australia staying the, si staying the size it is. Um, with the number of employees and probably a lot of the union agreements. So, so tell us about that. So, yeah, Bain Capital have come in. The, the, the um, Cyrus were probably um, playing a negotiating trick or a ploy, but it was their bluff was called. They, they, yeah, they, um, they, they pulled out citing that they were having a bad experience with Deloitte's. Um, they were pulling their bid out, wanting an explanation from the, um, from Deloitte's, and offered to um, rebid once they had their concerns addressed. They decided the the, the um, insolvency company decided to not do that. They went with Bain. They chose Bain. 
interesting. Um, Bain has a relationship with um, Richard Branson through his cruise ship company, so so they they do know Branson. So who knows whose side Branson was actually on, and who knows how much. Um, influence Branson has over the whole thing. He has said he will um, reinstate his 10% investment in the airline, which he lost when it went bankrupt. The Bain plan is, I, th I think they were all pretty similar in terms of what they're going to do. They're going to give up head-to-head -head competition with, with Qantas. They're going to concentrate on profitable routes, which is an interesting concept. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I see they've closed the their invitation-only invitation lounge, which Borghetti set up a few weeks after Qantas set up their invitation-only Senators Club. So, yeah, another failed Qantas um, following trick. They reckon they're going to reduce the fleet by sort of 40 to 50%. They're going to get rid of all the wide bodies. Um, the chairman of the company is going to be the ex-Jetstar -Jet CEO, that guy Hrudka, whatever his name is. And the CEO is going to be the current guy, I think his name's Paul Scurra, who, who, to his credit, had largely outlined a very similar strategy before it all went down the drain. So, yeah, um, 40 to 50% 40, 40 to reduction in fleet, cutting a, all the non-profitable routes. Um, they employ 17,000 people now, 16,000 people now. Qantas has just got rid of, got, got of 6,000. I expect Virgin will be doing the same thing very, very shortly. Got a nice uh, picture in the background of the Virgin cruise ship, Scarlet yeah. Lady, which looks uh, pretty cool. Um, the thing about um, Virgin Australia, though, is there's seven billion dollars of debt. Hmm. I mean, well, they're going to get that's, so a, get, that's get, a monster debt. Apparently, they're paying well over the rates for the A330s at the moment. So, the, the, you know, they're going to get rid of a lot of aircraft. They'll save a lot in um, servicing those far airports where they weren't making any money anyway. They're going to have to recapitalize. So Virgin's going to put a, put a, a, a probably, or Branson's going to put a reasonable chunk of money back into the business. I mean, he can put a reasonable chunk of money back into the business by simply reducing the annual fee they charge for the Virgin brand licensing. And do you know how, that much, how much that was, Paul? No. $15 million a year they were paying for the Virgin 50 name. $15 million. 15, one five. Oh, oh, wow, 15, wow. Well, that's small beer up against 7 billion, but hell, that's um, still that's it's a, not it's bad a, cash. That's 300k a week you got to find. Gee. And I just wonder <laughs> even if that brand really does, we've talked about this so many times, even is worth that now. I, I think they should go with something like TAA or something like that, but there Back you go, that's me. And that's the old TAA. And see. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting to see whether the bids whether the because they've still got to go through the details. It's going to be accepted in August, I think, by the first of August. They've got to get it done, and um, it's all going to be negotiating about how many people they can get rid of. And they're going to get they want to get you know if they're going to reduce their fleet by forty percent, they want to they're going to want to get rid of fifty percent of their people. I mean, all you know, they're going to cut back on lounges, all this type of thing. It's it's going to be. Um, you know, the, 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 the wording's the wording's actually very clever. They say, oh, no, they're going to maintain all their staff entitlements and this, that, and the other, but they're going to reduce the fleet by 40 to 50%. So, yeah, the, 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 basically they're going to pay off half of them, at least half of them. Well, the, the manager, it says here, of the Australian-based um, uh, Bain Capital, Mike Murphy, said uh, their plan is for Virgin to return to its core strengths. Well, I mean, its core strengths were, were actually, like we've said before, the little underdog... Uh, low-cost carrier. Maybe they um, won't quite go back to that. Under our ownership, we will strengthen Virgin's regional services. Really? <laughs> do, you, do you think so? Um, uh, and ensure the airline emerges offering exceptional experience at great value while continuing continuing to service business travellers. So, um, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think when they say they're going to service, the, they're going to increase their regional services. I think they're going to go hard after the after the fly in, fly out business. Right, because that's a that's a good little earner, and that hasn't really been affected by COVID. I mean, here up in Roma, the, the fly in, fly out, the Alliance Fokker Seventy is still coming in every day. Right, still going, eh? The old still Fokker going. Seventy, yeah. eh? Great. Ah, oh, it's a great plane. Yeah, big, I looked over big, some F twenty eight in Perth once, and I thought it's a big plane for only seventy people. Yeah, it, it, that that often surprises me. In, and and I've, I've spent a lot of time in Holland, and or in the Netherlands, 
and you know it's a little country and and you'd think everything would be small but you get on a dutch train and you think oh my god it is built like it's it's like a tank and the Fokker 70 is the same it's it's big it's a beefy plane which is why they last so well yeah that's also right. why they didn't make any money on them I watched uh, some um, video footage of them. It must have been when they were um, flying the Fokker 70 and test flying, you know. When they came out, it was after the Fokker 100, wasn't it, the 70? I don't know. It was, a, know. Don't, uh, it was a shrink. They were doing stalls and, you know, like spins and everything. It's incredible watching. And they had all the tape over the wings so you could see the airflow and the oh, disturbance. Yeah. It was really cool. And, I mean, they were really putting it through its paces. It was almost in spins. And you hear these guys talking in Dutch, you know, um, yeah. working out how to get out. of It was pretty cool stuff. So, okay, so um, I wonder, I mean, what's Qantas going to be thinking? Oh, yeah, they come and they go. They come and yeah. they go. We're always here. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. And, yeah. and I, I mean, I think I think Virgin has an opportunity. I just don't see, I, I, obviously, I don't know the, the ins and outs of the deal. And I don't know absolutely nothing about the business, apart from the fact they've made a colossal mistake the last 10 years. But, but um there must be something in it as opposed to opening up a new airline. Because I would have thought opening up a new airline now would be even easier because you're going to get the planes for nothing. Yeah, well, let's get on to that because um, you mentioned last podcast about uh, the leasing environment and you've been talking to uh, someone you know well who's in that business, like right at the core of it. It, it turns out it's even worse than, than that, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely, yeah, his, his words are that it is an absolute catastrophe because, so he works for a bank which actually buys the planes and they place them with leasing companies to, 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 to get them out there and generate, um, generate the money. And these leasing agreements are actually pretty cool um, if you're a leasing company. They, they, there is actually, in, in most um, leasing agreements, there's no such thing as an act of God. The, the, this, this the, in, in terms of being able to, to, avoid the, to avoid the lease. If you lease a plane, you're paying for that plane whether you can afford it or not. The only out you've got is if you can't afford to pay it, pay for it, you get it released out to someone else during your time, and even then you probably still have to pay a little bit on top of it, right? right? So there's basically no way escaping. It's like student debt. If you lease a plane and things go wrong, you can't actually get rid of it. However, what's happening now in the, the I know the UK is seriously considering it. They're, it's gonna go through the House of Lords pretty soon. And Hong Kong are also looking at it. They are looking at bringing in chapter 11 style bankruptcy protection for airlines. Right. And that's basically going to allow airlines as they can in America to trade while insolvent. And this is, this is very, very frightening for the leasing companies as well. It's one of the things which is very, very frightening for the leasing company. So there's a, there's a couple of things. Bankruptcy protection for airlines in the UK and Hong Kong mean that that day Virgin and BA will return all their aircraft and open up the next morning as a new airline, basically. Wow. Just kicking the can down the road. (laughs) <laughs> pretty much see you later yeah so and and hong kong will do the same thing cafe and all the hong kong based airlines will do the same thing the other thing is is that um all these all these um leasing companies that carry a huge amount of debt they've been wrapping that up in bonds and selling it as financial um um investments to or derivatives yeah yeah to insurance companies and all this type of thing those bonds are now absolutely worthless absolutely Ooh. worthless right? so they're they gone from billions money. to nothing Billions to nothing. And then you've got the problem of what are you going to do with all these aircraft? Just First of all, where are they going to go? Yeah. And, I mean, luckily, interestingly enough, Spain has a lot of empty airports. Okay. And they're already, they're already buying up space at these. Um, you know, the EU and, and Spain got together and decided as a bit of an infrastructure fund, similar to roading, they'd go and build regional airports all over the place that have never been used. Some of them have never been used. I guess you guys, some of the guys out there might have seen that Top Gear episode where they, they were testing on an airport, which had never, ever been used. And yeah. there's a few of them. And so these leasing companies are going out, or, or, the, or the bank actually, the finances the leasing company, because they're, they're the ultimate owners of these aircraft. Um, they're already going around buying up space at these airports to, um, to put all these planes in. So, so you've got the fact that s- some major countries might be offering bankruptcy protection to airlines. You've got the fact that all the debt's wrapped up in bonds, which have been sold to investors, which is now worthless, right? 
and then you've got what to do with all these aircraft. And and they're saying that it's actually, ironically, old gas guzzler planes might actually come back because they're just they they are low cost of fuel and very cheap to operate, and you can you can afford to own them. You don't need to go and lease them. So you could go and buy an old seven three seven four hundred or an early eight and do it up and run it and don't worry about that it's not a neo or anything because you can't get hold of them because they're, they're, they've all been ordered there's a huge backlog yeah and you don't necessarily want to lease them because you're tied to, people are going to be afraid of the whole leasing model so it, the, this guy's saying that there might be a, yeah there, there might be a market for older gas guzzlers that's interesting uh yeah that might postpone the uh like ba retiring their seven fours and things like that i wondered about that actually i did wonder about that yeah yeah, and especially if they own them. So, so, and, and, and we actually touched on that. So, BA get bankruptcy protection. They got 3747s in the desert. They get rid of all their leased aircraft. They bring the 747s back. Yeah. Because they, they still own got them. all the infrastructure to operate and, uh, and maintain got them. All the infrastructure to operate them. Yeah. And they've all been bought in the 90s, so they're way paid down. Way, yeah, yeah, that that is, yeah, and 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 it, it, Lufthansa is in quite a good situation too because they also own a lot of their aircraft. They lease a lot, but they also own a lot. Well, I wonder what Air New Zealand will do. It seems to be about a forty, sixty, somewhere close to that, but between leased and owned, they might be seeking to do that. But we don't have that sort of protection law here, do we? Bankruptcy no. protection. No, but you can guarantee that if the Poms do it, um, Aussie and 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 New Zealand will be. Uh, not far after it because it's a, it's actually a pretty good deal, and the only people that hurt are the offshore financiers. Um, I've got a picture up here in the background of a LATAM seven six seven, and um, they're one of the airlines trying to get rid of leased aircraft, and they're in Chapter Eleven, so that's the U.S. bankruptcy yes. uh, protection. Um, yeah. Uh, well, their and, headquarters uh, are in Miami, aren't they? I think I think LATAM's headquarters are Miami. Yeah, well, this is um, the Bankruptcy Court for Southern District of New York agreed to 25 motions made by LATAM Airlines Group. The main one is they want to return 65 of their aircraft to 65. less or 65. Yeah, and, and, and they stop paying for them, whereas, whereas in a country which doesn't have that protection, you can return the airplanes, but you'd be paying for them. And I guess if you've still got 10 or 20, 767, 300 ERs that you've had for the last 25 years, let the other stuff go. Just operate them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's wow. kind of what the guy was saying. Yeah. Just keep the old gas guzzers in the fleet and keep on going. And if you need yeah. new airplanes, go and pick some up out the desert and keep on going. Well, not new aircraft, but more capacity. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I wonder whether those A34600s will be snapped up because that's a pretty good plane. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it, now I was just bringing this up. I think there's a... Um, uh, um, was it one of the um, low-cost carriers in in Europe has changed its name? Was it Zoom? Or no, one of the other characters. Look, I'll find that story. I saw that. It, uh, it caught my uh, eye. But anyway, um, yeah, look for uh, look for Alice Springs to fill up like there's no more space. Well, the thing is with Alice Springs, it's a great place to store aircraft, and it's a great place to store regional you know, aircraft from the region, but, but um, it's a hell of a long way from anywhere. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll find that story that I was thinking of. But uh, unprecedented changes, and this could take nigh on a decade to roll through when you think about it. And, of course, then the manufacturers, they don't want, like, you know, early seven three seven eight hundreds or seven hundreds or whatever they are, or getting in the way for the next X amount of years of selling new planes. So, I mean, I can see Boeing doing a fire sale of those Maxes. That they're going to have to. They're going to have to fire sale because they're going to have to do two things. They have to keep that production line going, but they also have to knock all those other cheap frames out of the play, don't they? So, yeah, and and maybe Airbus too. Yeah, I, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they've got no idea what to do, and that's all going to come out in the next, uh, you know, one to three months. They, 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 there will be a huge panic because the, 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 the only alternative is to get a whole lot smaller and just start cancelling that backlog, which is, um, and, not, and that's that not obviously the, the US relationship in terms of aviation with China is smashed for now. They're not going to buy any. 
Boeing aircraft, are they? Not, are they accepting orders or, 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 or deliveries? I don't know. I haven't seen anything. But surely, um, yeah. you know, that would be one thing that China would do very quickly is say, okay, no more. No more from you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that'll probably be hidden at the moment because they're not really in a position to grandly announce that they're ordering aircraft to then say, but not from Boeing. Because I'm sure that's what they'd like to do. So they're going to wait till things pick up a bit and then they're going to say, yes, we're ordering a whole lot of planes and none from you, my friend. Yeah. and But then uh, if Airbus steps in, the Americans will have a problem with that. So they'll start putting pressure on the European governments involved in the Airbus um, consortium. Because they do, they do. There'll be, there'll be trade um, accusations and all this stuff and nonsense going on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's going to be a fascinating period coming up. And, and we've, got, um, we've got those Poseidons coming up soon, I think in the next year or so, those uh, P8. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that they're means still, that yeah. Boeing's still building 800 frames, eh? Yes, yes, they, and they're still delivering those. I mean, they've been delivering aircraft to, to FedEx during this downturn. They've been um, the Poseidons are going out, so the military, the military aircraft side is, um, yeah, is apparently unaffected. Mm. Yeah, um, some interesting, interesting news about the seven three seven Max. And right. you said last time that they're, they're they're constantly revising orders down, which is um, orders from their suppliers down. Um, it's heading towards flight testing very soon. And um, they reckon within the next couple of weeks, it should resume flight testing. But the Euro, well, three foreign um, um, regulators are insisting that, there's, um, that there needs to be design changes made to the flight control system. And it's probably going to be more about sensors and data than it is about actual um, mechanical changes. But they've all agreed they can be retrofitted once the aircraft is back in service, provided um, adequate training and and um, documentation is 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 provided to the airlines to help them cope with the foibles, let's call them foibles of of um, 737 Max operation. So that's quite a big deal, and and they think it's going to severely reduce. Boeing's profit on those planes precisely at a time when they need to make a lot of money on those planes because the, you know, each plane is, it's going to be, um, they, they, they assume it's going to be a field um, fitted kit, but it's, it's going to be days, not hours to fit. And then you've got to test fly it and, and all on Boeing's dollar. They've also got to go and test. Um, they've got to do mechanical changes to the nacelles because as part of a cost cutting drive, they got rid of a lot of the lightning protection around the composite and the cells and um the faa has come back and said well that actually is quite dangerous because um if you do get an electric uh you know a shock to the system uh, um you could end up getting um bad engine readings and everything so they've got to go back and do something about that so it's just piling on for um for boeing but the good thing is they should get it back into testing soon what the what the um appetite will be for that aircraft that that's um that's the next problem they've got. And interestingly enough, there's a guy, um, a flight deck system specialist, and he's he's written a, he's they're calling him a whistleblower, but he's written a letter. He wrote a letter to Congress that's been taken quite seriously um, to the extent that he's been invest or not investigated, interviewed by the FBI and asked to hand over all his papers. Now he was pushing for a um, synthetic airspeed capability to be added to the 737 MAX. When he first became involved in the project back in 2014, he, he said, you, you need to do more on this plane. You need to have a system which can cross-check your um, traditional speed readings. And of course, a synthetic airspeed, it, it uses GPS, um, inertia sensors, and a very, it, a very simple dynamic flight model of the aircraft. So basically it's 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 a very simple version of what you'd have if you had a fly by wire control system. But it's a it's a separate sensor and it provides it provides information back to the pilots in the event that they don't trust the sensors. It would be a cross checker. And he and he said that it, it should be added, but of course it wasn't added because it's quite expensive. And because it's a synthetic um, um, airspeed sensor, it takes information from a lot of parts of the plane. It has to be quite seriously tested software written, tested, software written, tested, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until it gets certified. And of course that just got shot right down because it would have delayed or added more to the flight testing yeah. burden. It would have cost more money and it was something else that the 
crew would have had to have been trained on. And if there's one thing Boeing wanted to avoid through this whole process was having to have the crew trained for anything. That was the whole point. Else. Yeah, that was the whole point. If you could fly a 737-200, you could fly the MAX. Incredible, I had to think that the two are, I mean, it's there's so many years between those two. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. It's 50 years, 60 years almost. Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay, yes. well, so, um, that's so yeah, um, what, watch. There's going to be a lot of activity when that comes in. Um, I see that uh, the AAIB, which is the uh, Pakistan Aircraft Accident Investigation Board, has released a preliminary report on the Pakistan Airlines uh, Flight 8303 crash, the A320 at Karachi. And uh, my golly, it's just as bad as everyone thought it would be and, and kind of worse. Um, uh, the, the approach was so bungled, it was unbelievable. Um, those guys didn't seem to really know what they were doing. The controller tried to help them, but again, there's some criticism about um, the controller not warning them that the undercarriage was down. In fact, the tower didn't even give them a direct clearance to land. That was phoned through from the controller. All these weird things happening. And then the story that it looks like a huge quantity of Pakistani airline pilots are flying on falsified licenses. And well, that's, that's, uh, already it says yeah. in this story I've got up here that there may have been as many as 150 pilots purged out of Pakistan International Airlines just in the last few weeks because they're credentials are bogus that's frightening frightening well don't be i was i was actually going to say don't be too hard on those guys that crashed the plane because they probably didn't have licenses so you know <laughs> not real yeah, ones no, anyway a, they reckon it's a third a third of the pakistan um um commercially licensed pilots probably don't have licenses proper licenses um 262 265 licenses have been withdrawn as of i think friday um, I, 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 how surprised are we? Well, there's, you know, there's corruption, but then there's like epic corruption where you're putting people in, in pilot seats on sophisticated machines that if you get it wrong, bad things can happen. And, you know, people are, are prepared to let that happen. It's incredible. If you've got a, if you've got a, a, a feudal society, which is all based upon, upon connections and everything you, you you can't you can't go and add 20th 21st century processes and procedures and expect people to follow them that the the underlying issue is that if someone's of a higher status than you and got more money than you they can buy what the hell they want that's the way the world works in those places so if you if you if, if you own a whole lot of land and your son really wants to be an airline pilot but he can't really be bothered to do the training apart from maybe a little bit and you can sort of rush things along and get them a license, you, you would do that. And no matter how bad the official feels about doing it, he will do it. He will do it because of, you know, connections and, and all sorts of things. So if, and, and, and so, okay. So the pilot's licenses are all dodgy. Um, I wonder what their approach procedures and the, any procedures, you know, you wonder if anything are up to snuff. Well, um, the, the interesting thing about reading these details, and I suggest people just search them out. I mean, there's too much to talk about here. But even after this completely bungled approach, landing with gears up on the nacelles of the engines and actually going into reverse, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there were two touchdowns or scrapes on the runway um, with the engines and no gear. They somehow got it back into the air, which is miraculous, with damaged engines. Then for some reason, they put the undercarriage down, retracted it, and put it down again. And they were um, flying in that um, uh, post the um, getting airborne again with slats out, no flaps, ultra slow, right on the edge of uh, stall. Everything they did, they did every single thing wrong. Every hmm. single thing right to the hmm. moment it hit the deck, you know, um, hmm. they, they didn't know how to do anything. These people. Well, I think that's the point. They didn't know how to fly airplanes. No. And, and then <laughs> that gets us on to this whole, um, machine operation. Maybe you can get away with flying an aircraft now, given the fly by wire avionics. It's kind of like knowing how to operate your, um, device at home or your personal computer or, or a particular piece of software. Um, without the sort of like uh, the, the years of experience doing it before it used to be a manual system, 
So you don't really need to know how to actually fly. Well, Cirrus, the Cirrus jet, and I think the Cirrus SR-22, they now have that button on the roof of the cockpit that if you, if, if something happens to the pilot, um, you can push this button and it'll locate the nearest airport and land there for you right. with no input. <laughs> and you wonder, you wonder, yeah, well, I mean, we don't need to wonder. It is, it is a hundred percent definite that within the next, within the next four or five years, full autonomy will be possible. It won't be allowed because of, 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 of the um, certification rules and everything. But within 10, 20 years, it's going to be monitored autonomy, isn't it? That's what it's yeah. going to be. Well, so, I, yeah. I think that's going to be safer than having two people who don't, who just are random, you know, if anything falls out yeah. of, of pushing buttons or, or, or spinning knobs and actually reverts to a, you know, a manual operation and not only that but also thinking manually they just can't do it well or, as usual it'll be, it'll be the insurance companies will be the driver behind it because they will say to com- countries like pakistan and places like this yeah we'll sell you a plane you can you can register a plane but it has to be fully autonomous or or, or yeah otherwise we autonomous. otherwise we're not covering it we, we and yeah. i think there's a, it's better to say that if an insurance company is not there it probably is not going to happen <laughs> yeah you've yeah. got to, you've got to have that yeah and um yeah i'm surprised it hasn't it hasn't there's not more talk about that but it'll it'll definitely happen well um did you, did you, did you see that thing about the world's first uh, um electric commercial aircraft is is um certified for its... yeah yeah um it looks really interesting it can take 12 people a thousand kilometers Wow. Yeah, it's a tail dragger too. It's a tail dragger. I'm just dialing it up. Um, Certified. I think certified is the the big news, isn't it? Oh, here we go. Is this... um... No, 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 no. That doesn't look like it. Okay. It's a twin. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'd have to do a search on um, using the settings and, and... you know, when, when, when that was reported, oh, here we go. Might, might be this. Uh, what do we got here? No, that's the same thing, but that's the way of the future. And to get around the green pushback, that's what's going to have to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you could see something like the geared turbo fan going electric. Well, um, um, Couldn't you? turbochargers, turbochargers and cars now are going electric. Um, I think Mercedes what? and BMW are now fitting um, electric turbochargers, which spin it up to you know eighty-five thousand RPM. Um, Gee. So yeah, it's 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 definitely um, definitely likely to happen. Here, here's a picture of that plane. I'll I'll I'll, I'll put it on. Yeah. Well, let me just let me just get the picture up. There you go. Looks like you got a lovely day in Roma today, by the way. Lovely day in Roma. There we go. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's funky. (laughs) Mm. So where's the, is there a a prop on the back? Yeah, they're on the tips of the wings, which um, which is pretty interesting in case it gets asymmetric. But yeah, that's, that's the, um, Right. That's the thing, yeah. Very well, if they're really cheap to operate, let's say, um, it's possible that you could uh, then operate smaller aircraft more frequently and and still get the, um, you know, the benefits in terms of... Over- oh, it's just a video. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the wings, the, the engines are pusher props on, on what would be the tip tanks in a normal, in a normal right. aircraft, which is... Oh yeah, I Which, see. Yeah. And I think it's got one at the back too. Yeah, it's got one yeah, at the back. Yeah. 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 So it's a so it's a, a very a, cool a, tri- a triplane. It's called the Aviation Alice. Is that an Israeli company? Hmm. I think it is. Hmm. It is. It's Israeli. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that looks have... so futuristic. You can see that scaled up. You know, with maybe another five props 
distributed along yeah. the wings, looking like the the, the peacemaker. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be yeah, it'll be amazing actually. I'd like I'd like to see it in action, and I and I think it's great that they 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 seem to be bringing back a tail dragger, which I don't know how that works with a prop at the back, but I guess that prop maybe stops the landing and takeoff. And one thousand miles. 600, 600 miles, so a thousand k's. A oh, thousand k's, a big button. So you could operate that like an air taxi in this in a, in a country this size, easy. Hmm. Hmm. Provided like an you Uber can, of the air, mate. Uber of the air. Provided it's got fast, fast charging. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want to park it up for three days while you charge it from your house plug, but yeah. Yeah, if you Incredible. could if you could turn it around in an hour, it starts becoming plausible to all those little far flung air, air airports at the moment, which don't have air service. Because you know, you got to put fuel there, you got to have a fire truck, you got to. I mean, you'd probably still have to have a fire truck, but um, well, it wouldn't be the same yeah. because you're carrying nothing flammable. Well, the batteries could catch fire, but that might be be more of an evacuation service rather than actually having to put the fire. Out. Yeah, um, it, it, it's really really. Um, I think it's cool. It's very cool. Very cool indeed. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, yeah. I, I think that we should try and get involved in that as a country somehow. Um, uh, you know, again, we should be talking to these people and, and maybe trying to be part of the whole deal. Something, a project like that anyway. I mean, a little air taxi service in in, in um, New Zealand would be perfect. And it would be, you know, if it, if it is twin engine reliability or, or even if it was a big single that was more reliable, wouldn't that be ideal for sounds air going across the straits and everything? It'd be, uh, it'd be ideal for uh, anything to any provincial airport would be ideal. It, it would. Because think, yeah. if it's cheap enough, you could literally fly two aircraft together. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, how much is it to top up on the power? 50 bucks? <laughs> well, in, indeed. And, and all the airport would need would be a, um, you know, a, a $200,000 solar array and a couple of batteries. And that would be it for fuel. That would be it. And in the meantime, Incredible. when the airline's not using it, they could be supplying the town. Amazing. Yeah. That, that's, that's so fascinating. That's so it interesting is. to think about where they could go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, you just think about it. You, you, you put up a big solar array, which is not expensive these days. You put in your batteries, you fill up your plane and on the days it's not flying or the nights, there's no flights, feed it back into the grid. You know, like, like little towns out in the middle of nowhere could actually get an air service again. It would become the de Havilland rapide of the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, have you seen this guy, um, this guy, Rami's yes. um, A350 yes. model now. Yeah, I have. I, I, I do have a look at Rami. Oh, I'll just, just there. hold it there. I'll just, I'll just put it on the back, uh, uh, on the back uh, screen here. But, uh, man, he does a great job of, of making a realistic-looking model, doesn't he? Out of foam. Out of foam. And the gear works and the engines look real. And, no, you know, the no, thing... No. Um, it doesn't quite fly to scale because the physics are, you know, the, the, as you reduce it they down, it do. looks a, a little comical. But, I mean, in slow motion, everything looked pretty good. But, I mean, look at that thing there. It looks amazing. The only, one, the only ones that um, fly to scale are those, and I've, I've mentioned this before, are those tiny, tiny little um, sort of figure light indoor, indoor models. That they do. Yeah, they fly real. Wow. Yeah. They look like yeah. they do. And the, yeah. and the amount of detail these guys put in planes, which, which weigh literally nothing, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's, it is incredible. It's fantastic. So yeah, I you know, look, at the, look at the screen now. Look, at here's the interior of that electric plane. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. And it probably make no noise. So there you go, nine passengers, 240 knots, 540 nautical miles. Which is and that's just the start. Miles. That that um, is the hottest thing I've seen in a long time. Wow, that looks cool. Yeah, it's got all the things I like: three engines and a V tail. Brilliant. Yeah. And with that, uh, with three of them, even if you lose a wingtip engine, you've, you're not going to go that much asymmetric because you've got the middle one. Yeah, well, I hadn't actually noticed the middle engine because I was worried about having wingtip engines like that. It would be quite asymmetric. But as long as you, as long as yeah, as long as you, um, that should be all right. Yeah. In any combination, it's not too bad. You lose the middle one, you still got symmetrical on the um, 
on the wings. Maybe one of them shuts down in feathers as they're going along. Who knows? Yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. That's, that, that's, that's the Alice Eviation or the Eviation Alice, I expect. It's probably that way around. That's brilliant. That's, that's one of the coolest things I've seen for a long time. Long time. Yeah. And it's been quite quick, you know. We haven't really heard much about it. Now it's already out there. Yep. And this is, this is the future. Yep, it's it probably the future. A, so it probably came out of a um, stealth project to build very quiet planes to go and bomb neighbouring countries' um, nuclear <laughs> power station. <laughs> yeah, there, there's probably a military version already flying that we just never seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's get on to um, the um, feature aircraft, the Vickers VC10, and um, it's a beautiful plane. Um, one of the uh, good sites, if you want to. Uh, find a find a good site to look into the VC10 is um, try a little VC tenderness. Yes, that's a great site. Now I think um, I think that was actually an advertising slogan used. Yes, it the, was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A little VC tenderness. Here it is, and they've got all the details on uh, the VC10. Great sites, uh, great pictures, all the um, uh, historical information. And of course, links to uh, videos as well. Uh, and uh, there's a you know a um, menu on the side. You can see all all that going. But um, uh, 1962, the aircraft made its first flight. There's some great video of that flight. I think uh, Brian Trubshaw was the uh, Trubby was the uh, test pilot on both the standard uh, ATRA. I think was the registration of that aircraft and the Super. The Super is really the one that it all came together in. Um, but uh, there is uh, some great footage of the aircraft. Um, it, only a hundred. Only, only took about 150, 160 people. So they they didn't carry many people. Even the they super. had enormous range. Yeah. 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 The super was. Um, yeah, I think it maxed out like 160. Yeah. Um, designed it, it, it to have great flight. range. It, you know, it was it was well over five and a half thousand nautical miles traveled. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it burned at, quite at a bit of fuel because it had a thick wing, right? Yeah, it had a lot of wing, so it could sort of land like a Cessna. But um, it had, a, and it also had too much power. Yeah, it had you know eighty thousand pounds of thrust all up. Yeah, those those Conways, uh, that was to get off uh, high altitude uh, uh, runways through Africa and places like Khartoum and, yeah. and Johannesburg and places like that. Yeah. And it got along all right. There wasn't as, I don't think it was as fast as a 707, but it was still, you know, 550, 560 miles an hour. Yeah, on the it was pretty close. Um, uh, originally designed to carry 135 passengers in a two-class layout for BOAC, which is yes. quaint, really, isn't it? 150 that, well, that, was, more. That, that, that was before the Super. And then the Super was uh, like, an, uh, I don't know, an 18, 20-foot extension in length. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and it's interesting when you compare the design um, philosophy between the um, VC-10 and the Aleutian 162, a lot of people said the Aleutian was um, because it needed that. It had that retractable um, sort of peg leg that, that came out of the tail. So that That's it right. Didn't, um, but what that allowed them to do, they, they actually say, well, some people say the Aleutian was actually the better design because it let them have a longer plane and a smaller tail simply by adding that little that little wheel whereas right. um the vickers had to keep everything within balance structurally because they didn't want to do it well they didn't think they needed to do any of that and it, it resulted in an aircraft that was significantly heavier than it needed to be and compromised the design the illusion was quite a lot bigger and yeah and just as well yeah the americans didn't go for that configuration did they no they went for potted under the wings well, because they, they, they had got onto that technology early. I mean, it is, yeah, it, 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 is the, it is the way to go and was the way to go. Um, but, of course, if you, if, if, also it comes down to the design brief that, that um, Vickers was given. If, 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 you're, if you're flying um, foreign office personnel between the far-flung empire, foreign object damage is an issue. And, of course, the VC-10 never had an issue with that because... Mm. There was a very only a very small angle where anything could get up into the up into the engines, and otherwise it was shielded by the wing, and they were really high off the ground. 
but you know maintenance access was a hassle the, the, those forgings that hold those motors in place are big big heavy things there was actually a, a design study made to put two rb211s on the back of a, of a lengthened vc10 yeah i think that was the um the next um uh, concept wasn't mm. it would have been about as long as the the long dc8 they flew mm. Um, the RB211 on a VC10 as a test rig for a while. Mm. Mm. That would have been fascinating. But but when you read on, on, on VC tenderness on that website and on others, the, 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 the pilots say it was just so nice to fly, so easy. It just did everything you asked of it. Yeah, the prototype was uh, a, uh, G-A-R-V-A. I got that... Uh... That one wrong. Um, uh, first flight in uh, 1962. Uh, uh, it says here that the uh, specification for BOAC, BOAC was very restricted. And they say it was a tribute to the Vickers design team that they came up with an aircraft that could live up to it. So a bit of a challenge there. Because I guess out of every airline operation in the world back then, no one quite had to get around like BOAC. They had all these far-flung places, all different climates, different you know, different parts of the world with all different operating requirements. Um, and um, you yeah, kind of had no choice but to have very specific designs for that. Or, or, or they could have um, built runways, which would probably be cheaper in the long run because you wouldn't have spent millions of pounds developing a plane that wasn't very good for anything except those very narrow design parameters. Whereas if you'd sponsored a few national champions to go out into the empire and build two mile long runways everywhere, um, the whole, you know, it might have actually been a better policy. Yeah. Well, That's what um, the... Did, didn't they? You, you, you want to buy our plane, you build a runway. Yeah, and BOAC, um, from what I've read, um, after putting out the initial brief for this and, and, and constricting what that design team had to work with in comparison to the Boeing people, and then... They, they sort of, having said that in motion, it came time to take the aircraft. They got cold feet. They didn't want it. Yeah. Then they bought very few of them, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, I think, um, uh, there's a video of, um, of the head of BOAC at the time, Sir Miles, somebody, you know, he said, oh, it was a fantastic aircraft but flying it. But, you know, he did everything he could along with his management team to, to, to not ta take the orders and uh, to go with the 707. I guess politically that wasn't too good at the time. But, you know, fancy uh, creating a straitjacket that guarantees something will not be a commercial success when the company needs one. And then when they deliver it, they don't want it. <laughs> yeah, typical, that's so typical though, isn't it? You go nuts, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it did kick around with a few operators um, that – Pretty, um, uh, pretty Laker airline. What was it? British. Um, oh, I'll tell you. It'll come yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Air Malawi, Laker. Gulf Air. Huh? Yeah, BOAC, British Airways, British Canadian, British United Airways. British the United, Airways. that's the one. Operators, yeah. They had the one with the freight door at the front. They used to fly. There's a picture of Sir Freddie's ro roller coming off it, you know. Yes, yes, I've seen that picture. Yeah. yeah. So Gulf Air. Air Malawi had one, East African, yeah. they flew them. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying, obviously, BOAC, British Caledonian, Lebanon. they had a few. I think I think they ended up with a prototype, and they might have smashed that in a heavy landing. Ghana, so Ghana that, Airways. That Middle shot of the Eastern three in the Jordanian desert with one of them being the VC-10s being blown up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the British Air the British Air Force flew them for a long time. They flew them up until 2013, I think. 2012, K1 and K2 tankers, I think they used to call them. Yeah. And um, uh, and well, they uh, had them all. I, I've seen photos of them being fitted with the tanks. They actually removed roof sections and dropped the tanks and put the roof back on. But, uh, but they operate yeah. RAF operated them for well over 40 years, didn't they? Yes, yes, they operated them for a long time. Yeah, yeah. The Queen used to fly around on them. And I think, I think in terms of planes that look the same, the IL, I think I said 162 earlier, the IL-62 is still flying occasionally with Korean, um, North Korean airlines. And um, I think the Russians still have a couple, the military still have a couple of um, 62s flying around. Of course, the 62 carried about 30 passengers more, 30, 40 passengers more than the um, BC-10, but looks very, very similar. Um, you just reminded me, there's a video on... Um 
uh, obviously on YouTube, uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un flying in the TU-204 with a oh, yeah. captain in the right-hand seat. And it's, you know, it's got that stern narration from the woman, you know, like, yeah. a great leader will now fly the plane. And uh, they're trying to make him out to be a real expert. And as they're coming in, approaching the airport, he's like pointing out the window like some little kid, you know. And yeah. uh, and the narrator says, he is pointing out the window at the airport. <laughs> Um, but he doesn't seem to be holding any of the controls. No, no. Well, he doesn't um, need to because he's the great leader. The plane should do what it's do what he thinks it needs to do, right? Yeah, but they, what is it? Uh, Air Koy, Koyoro or something? Um, Koryo. Koryo. Koryo, yeah. Um, they've, uh, yeah, they've got a, uh, one or two IL-62 still operating. They look pretty pretty nice. They're nicely turned out. They look out. immaculate. Yeah, immaculate. Mm -hmm. Mind yeah, you, the yeah. entire concentration of uh, effort goes into probably about five airplanes, you know, so... Who yeah. that ne virtually never fly. Yeah, I had a I had a fantastic flight sim X VC ten model, which is one of the few planes I ever paid for. Right. Yeah. Well, there was yeah. a guy who used to do them, a British guy, I remember. Um, and in fact, yes, I might even did. have one on the flight sim now, but that might not have been the one you're talking about. He also did oh, the yes. BAC one eleven and the Trident. Oh, and he also did. I think he's the same guy that worked on a. Absolutely amazing. I had it in Condor livery, a TriStar. Oh, right. Oh, it was amazing. Anyway, anyway, I'm over flight mm. sim now. I've still got it. Uh, the new oh, one looks pretty good. The new one yeah, looks new fantastic. One and I've actually got a PC capable of running it now. I've, I've just it's got a PC that's um, almost overloaded with graphics cards. So we'll see how that goes. I need to do that because I want to upgrade. I've had flight sim X for so long. Still pretty good, I gotta say. Um, mm. I've seen a lot of X plane stuff. There's a real community out there, and that looks pretty cool. But um, you know, have to relearn all the controls, man. I don't know if I could. And I didn't. I never got prepared 3D. So, no. um, so we'll go for this new flight sim uh, 2020. It's Microsoft branding. Is it Microsoft product though, or are they? It's a third I'll party. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there'll be third-party developers involved, but it's their baby. They've they finally got back into it. I can't believe they ever got out of it because it was such a flagship for them. So many people had it, even if they didn't do much with it. And a big online community. It was one of the biggest at the time. Huge, yeah. No, it's going to be um, pretty pretty cool to see what they do with that. Yeah, and by all accounts, the, the first reviews are, you know, people are amazed. Yeah, I've and been watching some of the, the promo videos and talk about photo reel. Yeah, like photo reel to the max. So, yeah, yeah, and you'd want to see um, a third-party uh, aircraft like the VC-10 being created for that uh, package. You could, I mean, you could almost you, you could almost shoot scenes from that that would stand up in a movie. Well, they've 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 um, the 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 there the used to be a, a program on the Discovery Channel, um, and it was like famous dogfights where you know two guys in phantoms over Vietnam got bounced by two whatevers. And that was all done in X-Plane and, and the graphics were unbelievable. It was absolutely unbelievable how, how good the graphics were. Yeah. I remember you yeah. mentioning that at the time. Yeah. It was yeah stunning. Anyway, we've got um, anything else to talk about? Well, we I, just, um, I was going to add to that. If you, anyone wants to see um, a, uh, a VC 10, um, um, on display, I think it is it the Duxford Air Museum has uh, a BO an XBOAC super. Um, there's one in Germany too at that um, I forget what it's called, but there's there a, it is uh, there the cockpit of it. So you can go and see that and uh, go try that site. If people probably already know about it, but uh, the VC tenderness site will um, uh, have you um, knowing all you wanted to know. Uh, let's see if we can just before we go pull up a picture of a VC-10 in New Zealand because, as I say, they used to fly to um, to Auckland uh, back in the 60s, early 70s. Let's see if there's, there's a video also, there. There's, there's also great, video, there's great videos on on the, um, the YouTubes of um, the proving flights and Pathé. Pathé goes on a VC-10 journey and all this type of thing. It's fantastic. Yeah, I've seen some of those. Not bad. Uh, there's a, there is a, a, a picture here of um, a VC-10 at Auckland right here. 
So it's one of those you got to buy it before you can look at the whole thing, uh, Job. So okay, one of those. Yeah, there'll be there'll be plenty of others. Yeah, oh, there's plenty around. So um, uh, so go find out a bit more about the BC10. Um, I got to say, as a kid, I always thought that thing just looked like the epitome of you know, a, like a hot aircraft. You know, like yeah, there's the site, right? Okay, what it should um, look like. Yeah, plenty of. Um, are you going to the photo archives? Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah. Um, and of course, all the uh, skins were milled out of solid billets. Yes, yes, they. So they it was strong, as strong. Yeah. In fact, it might not even have had a structural life, so to speak, on it. See the see the flaps there. The flaps are pretty. The, the, yeah. A lot of flap. A lot of flap. Yeah. And the and the shape of the um, horizontal stabilizer is just amazing. Yes, it's a beautiful very, shape. Very, yeah, I think here's a he'll, he, this will show you a picture of it. See the yeah, look at it. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. So uh, a great aircraft, and that's our aircraft. Uh, yeah, and oh, it's a there's Nimrod a TriStar car. together. But the TriStar took yeah. over pretty well. The fuel link didn't, didn't it? Yeah, I think they were concurrent. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. And now it's the um, it's the A three the A three thirty, right? The Yes, yeah, the A330. I've got a particular MRT, name for it. Multi-role yeah, tank. Yeah. I see um, the Brits have painted up their one in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Boris Johnson 1 or whatever, <laughs> BJ1 oh, or whatever, uh, with a flag yeah. on and it looks pretty slick. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, great looking cockpit. Yes, BC, uh, v, uh, the, the web address is vc10.net. Right. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Uh, VC10.net. Yeah. And um, yeah. they've been around for a while, so they've accumulated a lot of uh, links, photos, videos, the whole thing. Great seeing those old uh, 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 Pathé movies and the old promotional BOA, BOAC movies, you know, where, where yeah. the, the narrator has got that particular... Uh, they were amazing uh, that scenes in Kampala. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. Um, uh, and, and, of course, you know, the, the crews... Uh, not a VC-10 video, but there's a BOAC-707 video, and uh, they're going through all the checks, and the co-pilot's call calling the captain, sir, all the time. Yes, we've yes, done that, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you know, fuel's checked, sir. Everything's sir, sir, sir. Yeah. Um, oh, as it should be, I guess. Yeah, well, as it should be. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's um, leave it there. Another good chat. And um, just remind people, if you want to support us, patreon.com um, forward slash NZ Aviation Podcast. Um, I'll put the uh, email. Um, well, I have the email address on the graphic there too. So if you want to get in contact with any suggestions or any comments, feel free. And um, we'll be back uh, probably about this time next week, Martin. And yeah. I'm picking that you'll still be where you are <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you still in business? No. That's that's no. gone. Gone, gone. Yeah. Gone, gone. All right. But tomorrow, I'm a bit busy. Tomorrow, I'm going to actually go. Um, oh, this will be interesting. I'm going to go and help a farmer cattle muster in one of those Honda um, four wheel buggy things. Oh wow! He asked me to come and take one of those and manage the tail end of the mob as he gets them from one fifty acre field to another fifty acre field. So. I, I got a feeling that you didn't anticipate you'd be doing that kind of work not too long ago. Mm, I quite like doing stuff like that, though. tearing around. Oh, no, that sounds like fun. It sounds like fun. Yeah. Pity it's not yeah. an R22 or something. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a few of those around here, actually. There's one every every Tuesday at the cattle auction. There's a guy who flies in and he's got an R44, actually. He, and right. he, just parks it, he just lands it in the bush next to the cattle yards. Well, yeah, why not? Just on the grass. And, and it's long grass. He just puts it down. Great. Yeah. All right. That's the whole point, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So it uh, reminds me of the R44 flight I did over Manaus in Brazil. That was pretty cool. They're actually quite solid little machines when you think about it. Oh, yeah. All right. So until next time, um, Paul Brennan from the bunker in Auckland, New Zealand, and Martin in the park in Roma, Australia. The park. <laughs> well, I can think of worse places to be. Yeah, there you go. It's a park. Look at that. That is so Aussie Bush. Yeah. Yeah. I can always tell if it's a, if it's Aussie Bush because of the spacing between the trees, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and if you walk down here early in the morning, because I often walk through here in the morning to get a coffee, it's chocker full of kangaroos, which are just simply bizarre creatures. Aren't they? Just bizarre. Yeah. Anyway. All right, well, maybe next time we'll see one. <laughs> Perhaps. All right, then. Take us for a tour. <laughs> yeah, well. All right, we'll, we'll call it the kangaroo route or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, we'll see you around soon. See you later.